So, uh, yeah, I've been working on this uh, library for a little while, and it's taken me a while to sort of figure out the, all the details of the, uh, the things I wanted to support, but I, I sort of finally got like a core set of functionality working. So I made this little demo to show it. Um, so you can run it in PSCI, it's quite nice. You just uh, drop into the wrapper with the port option, so you use the, uh, you know, the, the PSCI and the, and the browser option, and open your browser. Um, and then the, the default thing, um, you, know, you can just type these in. It, it has like default imports ready to go, so you can just sort of start using these. Um, the default thing, if you just type this into the REPL, will uh, just give you a uh, you know a dot that follows the cursor. Okay, you can see this, right? Yeah. Is this visible? Okay, good. So so you get this dot that follows the cursor. Okay, so that's that's this one here, right? I just say live. Um, so if I say like type of live. Okay, it takes a behavior of drawings, which I'll, I'll talk about this in a sec, uh, but I'll just give a quick overview. So you can give a, a behavior of drawings, which is like, you know, a drawing that varies with time, and it will just go and, you know, set it up uh, to, you know, update, uh, do like a request animation frame loop type of thing, and, and, uh, and you know, make it interactive, okay? Uh, so the behavior I use to begin with is just uh, a function of the current mouse position. So I use map, I uh, give it a function and, and map over the mouse position, and I take X and Y to a dot centered on X and Y with radius 50, okay? So just to be clear, dot has type number to number to number to drawing, so it's X and Y and radius to a drawing, okay? Map is just regular functor map, and mouse has type uh, behavior of a point, X and Y, okay? Um, Okay, so I, I made this function with radius, just to sort of abstract a little bit there, just pull this out. Uh, so I give it a, a radius, which is a behavior, and it will go and do the work that we just did, um, except it will, uh, it will also, you know, it will use applicative to sort of include the, uh, the radius function that you picked uh, and set the radius to that instead, okay? So type of with radius is uh, gonna be a behavior of number this time to the same type that's going to go set up the thing and, and, and make make your behavior interactive, okay? So the one that I just ran actually wasn't quite this, it was um, with radius pure 50, okay? Which is the same function, just sort of refactor a little bit. Okay, um, but we could do something else. So we could say, for example, um, we can do something depending on whether the, the mouse is clicked, okay? So we can say if the mouse is clicked, then 50 else 100. Okay. Oops. Uh, I did it wrong. Oh, with radius. Oh, I have to parenthesize this, don't I? That's why. Okay. Uh, so unit just means, you know, it didn't return anything. But if then we go back to our window. Uh, oh, I guess I got it the wrong way around. <laughs> uh, so now, if I if I'm clicking, then it's fifty. Otherwise, it's hundred. Okay. So now, you know, this is a this is an interactive function of uh, both the mouse position, the mouse buttons, and uh, time. Okay. Uh, but we're not really doing anything particularly interesting with time. So uh, let's see. We can do we can so uh, we can do things like integrate over time, which is kind of nice. Um, so this is one of the features that I had recently. So uh, let's see. So if we integrate with respect to time in seconds, uh, this function, okay, uh, which is 50 or zero, then this is going to grow with a constant rate of 50 when the mouse is down, or it's gonna stay still uh, when the mouse is not down. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, okay, so that's good. And then, see, so now if I leave my mouse up, it doesn't grow, but otherwise it grows steadily, okay? All right, so that's kind of nice. This is like a function of, of an actual function of time uh, and the mouse position and, and state, okay? Um, but we can do more interesting things, right? So um, if we can integrate, we can also solve differential equations. So uh, the cool thing about this library uh, is that it lets you um, solve, it, it lets you sort of express your application as a differential equation, like an interactive differential equation, okay? Uh, so interactive in the sense that it can depend on things like the keyboard and mouse state. Um, but you can also depend on uh, integrals and derivatives. Okay, so so this example, well, I, I guess I can just show the example and then we'll, sort of, we'll see what it does and then I'll explain. Okay, so I'm gonna enter paste mode, paste that, and then go back over here. Okay, so now if I hold the mouse down, it grows quickly, and then if I leave go, it sort of does this oscillation thing, okay? So what this is actually doing is, this is exponential growth when the mouse is down. When I leave go, it's a damped harmonic oscillator with friction. Oh well. Damped harmonic oscillator. 
so redundant to say with friction, I suppose. Um, okay, so this is it acts sort of like uh, yeah, exponential growth when the mouse is down, then when you leave the mouse up, it's like a pendulum with you know air resistance or something, right? Swinging back to its zero state, sort of thing. Okay, so just to sort of show how the code uh, implements that. So the uh, you can express both exponential growth and um, harmonic oscillator as uh, second or first order. Uh, or first or second order differential equations respectively, right? So they can both be captured by the second order differential equation, so I can solve it by integrating twice, okay? But the key is that um, the differential equation needs to refer to the function that I'm trying to define, right? Uh, differential equations say things like, you know, an exponential uh, function expressed as a derivative would be something like dy dx equals some constant times y, okay? Um, so it refers to y, the function I'm trying to define. So I have to, I have to use this fixed b combinator, which is like a fixed point, trying to construct a fixed point of functions. Okay, so you give it an initial value, and then it gives you back um, the behavior, like the time varying function that you want to define, right? And then you you can define it. Okay, so here I'm like referring to x itself, but defining x at the same time. Okay, uh, so this was sort of the thing that I wasn't really sure how to implement because you know. Um, it seems like you really need laziness here, but uh, basically you can implement this in pure script by just sort of uh, always sort of waiting one time step, right? Like you, uh, you sort of, everything is sort of approximate. We're doing sort of like Euler integration, right? But you can just wait till the next time step. So you can always refer to the function like one time step ago, okay? Um, and then this piece here, so we have to integrate twice, right? This is, uh, if you take the equation for the differential equation that I just said, right? Damped harmonic oscillator slash, uh, you know, exponential. Uh, actually, I guess it's not exponential, is it? It's, it's quadratic, sorry. Uh, so if you if you look at the equation for that, you can just pull it straight off Wikipedia and you just sort of rearrange it a little bit and integrate twice. Um, you get exactly this, right? So this is, um, this is just expressing that differential equation in a way such that we can integrate it twice and get like a, an actual solution, right? So here we have, um, you know, a function of time and um, a function of time and the mouse expressed uh, as a you know um, expressed as you know in such a way that we can take a fixed point. We integrate it twice and take the fixed point, and that gives us this behavior. Um, so that's that's the library in a nutshell, right? Um, and so the the things that I added recently were uh, fixed points, which I'm quite pleased with, uh, an integration and differentiation. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah, that's that's all I've got. So. Uh, <laughs> okay, you said you took the definition and integrated it twice. Mm -hmm. You mean like differentiated it twice, and then so that when you integrate integrated twice, you get back the no, so, original so, definition. So what I meant was that the the definition of a damped harmonic oscillator is is given like you can look it up on Wikipedia, right? But it's given as like a second order differential equation. So it's like um, it's a relationship between the second derivative, the first derivative, and the function itself. Okay, it's linear. Okay. Three things. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so then, all you have to do is say, well, if I just move all of the, uh, if I move the, the the pieces that depend only on the function itself and its first derivative onto, like, let's say, the right hand side of the equation, then I have something that looks like, you know, um, the second derivative equals some function of the first derivative and the function itself. Okay. Well, then if I just integrate that twice, then I I get a function that expresses. Um, the function itself in terms of some integral, some double integral, right? Um, and, and this is the thing that I need to integrate twice. So it's just basically rearranging the differential equation and, and solving it by, by integration. So it's a little bit weird because, you know, you have to like refer to the thing you're trying to define, right? But that's why we have this. Uh, that's why you have to provide the initial value and, uh, you know, it works sort of like one time step behind, right? That's okay. um, Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm thinking back in my physics in high school, basically. Just trying to remember how this stuff worked. Sure, so I guess I didn't link to the original repo here. Okay, so let's, I quickly want to just show a little bit about the, the implementation. Um, so there's another example in the in this repo here, um, which I don't think I've built on this machine, but you know, it does a similar thing where, you know, we have that same effect, you know, it expands and then it, it does this oscillation thing. Um, but there's a lot of circles, basically. So that's quite a nice example. Um, so yeah, the, the this library. Let me just give a, a quick intro to why I was interested in this. Right. So 
Um, first of all, I wanted to see if we could do sort of something a bit like real FRP in pure scripts um, with like actual functions of time, integration, fixed points, and what have you. Um, but then I had this sort of interesting idea, right? So uh, for the longest time, I couldn't quite get my head around directly around FRP, right? Like why, um, or rather, uh, what made sort of real FRP so special as opposed to uh, you know the the versions of FRP that we know from things like you know reactive extensions and Elm and, and where everything is sort of um, you know discrete time steps. Okay. Um, so it seemed to me like the question that always would go through my head is, well, everything's fine, right? Like the, the real world works with events like interrupts and whatnot. So we don't lose anything by just using events, right? So um, and it, it, the 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 time when I sort of like started to understand why it was uh, why it was more useful to think in terms of continuous time. Well, there's, there's two reasons I think, right? So. Uh, the first is that this operations on functions of continuous time that you can't really express nicely and composably when you're only working with events. Things like integration and fixed points, right? Those just sort of lend themselves really naturally to, um, you know, uh, close form uh, expressions as you know in terms of like continuous function of time. Um, and the other reason is that while you don't really lose anything in terms of expressivity, it's convenient to think about. Um, Instead of sort of dealing with events, right, where we have this sort of like implicit sampling uh, interval that's like running throughout our code, right? It's it's nice to think in terms of the functions we're trying to denote and then leave the sampling till the very last moment, right? So um, Connell Elliott, I've, I've heard him talk in the past about uh, you know the the similarity with like raster graphics and vector graphics, right? You want to sort of stay in the world of vector graphics as long as possible and then only rasterize when you're ready to sort of send it to the hardware for you know for rendering. Uh, so it's the same sort of thing, right? We want to work with these nice, smooth, continuous functions where we have these nice operations um, and everything sort of has a nice uh, interpretation, denotation, what have you. And then when we're ready, we can sample. But we want to leave that sampling to the very last moment. Does that make sense? <coughs> well, okay. Yeah, so, that's basically uh, the essence of composition, right? You delay decisions mm -hmm. as far as possible. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then uh, that gave me an idea for how we might solve the FRP Problem in uh, in pure scripts, right? So I thought, well, if you know, if really the only thing that differentiates um, behaviors from events is the fact that we was trying to delay sampling, right? Then why not just define a behavior to be a sampling function? Okay, we'll just say the only thing that a behavior is good for is sampling some event stream. Okay, so <clears throat> so in my version of this library, a behavior looks like this. Okay, um, actually, let's just look at the source. Uh, FRP behavior. So this is what a behavior looks like. Increase the font size a little bit. Um, it's literally just a sampling function. Okay, it takes an event um, and it gives back an event. So the event is the function is, is sort of the sampling uh, interval, right? Um, it's like saying I have some function of time in mind and I'm going to give you an event to sample it on, um, and you give me back the sampled event. Okay, um, so if it's not sort of clear why there's this for all in here, it's sort of the most general thing such that we can write, uh, let's see, where's my sample function? Okay, so here's sample, right? So it takes a behavior and an event and gives you back an event. And we want to sort of be able to apply this thing sort of like a function, right? So there's a function type on one side and a value on the other and you get back the value. Um, and it's just applying the function that's wrapped up. Okay, so let me know if this, uh, this isn't clear. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so... Uh, this thing has all the nice instances that you want, right? Specifically, applicative, um, which is kind of interesting because it only really this doesn't really care what the event type is, right? This thing is uh, an applicative for any applicative event type, which is sort of interesting, right? And I think there's some sort of interesting connection with like modal logic here, but I haven't quite figured it out. But basically, if you have some, you know, if you're thinking in terms of like temporal logic in FRP, right? You want your event type to somehow sort of like, that, that is, that's sort of like your, uh, you know, your sometimes modality, right? Something is sometimes true. Um, and you want to, if you want to define a always modality in terms of a sometimes modality, you can say something like, well, uh, A is always true if whenever, uh, whenever not A is sometimes true, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, 
uh, falsehood, right? <laughs> if that makes sense. You can sort of say, uh, if, well, I had to, to sort of explain that. Like, uh, if, uh, if sometimes uh, not A, then sometimes you have a contradiction. Well, the only time you could ever have a contradiction uh, is at the time when, um, you know, you, you thought that not A, not A was going to hold, right? Because the only way you could, you know, that's the only time you have any information to construct a contradiction out of. Well, so that's sort of like sampling, right? Uh, so I think there's, there's something sort of interesting going on there. But anyway, uh, if, you have, um, if you have an applicative event type, you can construct an applicative behavior type, which is kind of neat because it means that we could, uh, you know, I, I made my own event type here, but we could use signals or we could use, uh, you know, reactive extensions, uh, observables, or whatever we wanted and construct a behavior type from it. Okay. Um, okay, and then we just get uh, sort of all the standard combinators uh, uh, built on top of that abstraction, right? So we can build a step function where we start with a certain value and it changes when an event fires. We can unfold the behavior in terms of events. We can, um, <clears throat> there's various sampling functions. And then the interesting ones, right? So here's, uh, here's how to do integration. Um, you take a behavior uh, that gives you the current time and a behavior that gives you a value in some vector space and it gives you um, a behavior in that vector space that's been integrated over time. Right? No one go into the details, but here it's just basically doing, um, you know, Euler integration. Uh, the interesting bit is right here. Just, uh, well, I think it's using the rectangle rule or, or whatever you call it. Okay. Um, and then differentiation is the same. You know, uh, again, you give it a, a behavior that gives you the time, uh, and it does, uh, you know, it, it, it approximates the derivative by the uh, by looking at the slope between the last two time points. And then fixed points, right? So fixed points, uh, you know, you give it a function that expresses a behavior in terms of itself, and it gives you a behavior back. Well, so this is a little tricky to define, but <clears throat> we can just uh, create um, we can create an event that we're going to push uh, the the values into, okay, um, and then create a step function from that event, run our function over it, that gives us some behavior that sort of approximates the behavior we're trying to define, but one time step behind, okay? And then we can sample that on the sampling function that we're going to receive, and every time that fires, we can push it back into the event stream we're using to define that behavior, okay? Um, and then finally, we just sample that thing. So it took me a, like, it took me a while to figure out quite what to do here um, in such a way that everything works nicely, but uh, it came together, so I was quite pleased with that. And then finally, if you want to animate a behavior, you can just give it a behavior um, <clears throat> and a function that takes whatever it is you're trying to animate and renders it, and it'll just you know set that up and set it up running um, uh, using that request animation frame. So, so that's the whole library in a nutshell, basically. Uh, I don't really have anything else. So if you have any questions, I can answer them. It's better. So, because it differs to the event type that much, is it probably going to be like relying on the event type to not leak memory to? Right. So, uh, yes. So, in, in this case, my event type, it, you know, has uh, applicative instance, which is like a zippy applicative. It just like takes the latest from both sides, um, and it has an alternative, but it doesn't have a monad instance. So, this, this this event type is sort of safe in terms of you know uh, how much you know, how much of the past it remembers, okay? It has something like fold P from Elm, which I called fold, okay? Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have any combinators which sort of, uh, uh, you know, use increasing amounts of memory because it, like, remembers all of the past or anything like that. If you wanted to use dynamic events, like with, with monadic events, you could do that, and you could build a behavior item in, in exactly the same way, and there'd probably be some more interesting combinators you could write on behaviors too. Uh, but I haven't done that. This was enough to do the stuff I wanted to do. Oh yeah, I should just say there's there's a few sort of standard things in here, right? So uh, time, I think there's a behavior, uh, like you know, a behavior of integers that gives you the current time in millis. Uh, a behavior of uh, yeah, I already showed position, right? That's uh, a record. Um, the behavior of the mouse buttons that are pressed, which is a set, and so on. Okay, so that's, that's it, unless anybody has questions, like I say. Yeah, thanks.
That was pretty cool. Thanks. Yeah, that's really neat. <laughs> what was the key difference between this and because uh, there's like the signals business also? Um, what's the yeah, key difference? So, between so, this signals, and that? so signals. So um, signals. Right. So uh, signals are like events, but where there's an, like an initial value, right? Um, so, so yeah, I was thinking about that a little bit. Um, so, so the alternative way I was thinking of constructing behaviors was to say, instead of saying, let's identify a behavior with a um, sampling function, which is like, um, that's like saying, uh, I don't want to say this, that's, um, that's like sort of in, that's like constructing it as uh, a fold, right? Like a recursive data type, almost like it, we're, we're we're defining it in terms of its own fold or something, right? Instead, we could define it as an unfold by taking a step. We could try and define it in terms of how you would build it as a step function. Okay, you give it, you give an event, and you give a seed value, um, and and pairing those two things together would give you a behavior. Okay, that's sort of like what signal does, right? So you could do that, and I actually started working that way. Um, but the problem is that uh, while that gives you like a notion of behavior, it doesn't really delay the sampling uh, in the right way, right? So um, you end up sort of doing sampling in more places than you'd want to do. That was what I found. Um, and that sort of defeats the point, I think. So if you, if you want to, I mean, so signals are great for certain things, right? And behaviors are great for certain things, but they're great for different things. So if you want to, if you want your application to, if your model for your application is, an interactive differential equation, then behaviors is fantastic, right? If you, <clears throat> if it's not, then maybe, you know, uh, this extra machinery is sort of like a bit uh, heavy and maybe signals would be better instead. Okay, so just different tools for different things, I think. So you say that the behaviors is uh, based on sampling uh, like the events. Um, so the idea is that we have, um, everything is just a big event network. Right, but um, at some point, like we have to go and sample all the things, right, that we're, we're interested in. Um, what behaviors does is it sort of it defers that sampling to the very end, right? But at some point, you want to like construct one event that you can that you can like subscribe to and, and use for rendering, right? Um, behaviors construct that like sort of the way you would do it is you build a behavior and then you sample that behavior at the last, you know, that'd be the last thing you did, and then you subscribe to the sample behavior. Um, with signals, you might subscribe to a whole bunch of events and then wire them up to like create one sort of like um, like application, you know, one UI. Um, so it's just sort of a different way of working. You don't like say you don't lose any expressivity, I don't think, but uh, it would be more sort of cumbersome to wire up the events yourself in the way that behaviors does it. Is there certain things that can be? Uh that, that, that can't be a behavior because I'm thinking like you say sample and like and then I think well if there's some things you can't sample sample maybe uh, like you were doing a lot, like a lot of time right here, right here so like you sample mm -hmm. the current time and the, like the time is kind of always available for you to sample but other events like XHRs come into your app or uh, like timers you know happening like are right. these these also fit in your model too like if if uh, some external like one of these one time events happens then you just store it until you can sample it is this how you're thinking yeah so you, i mean you can always bring you can always express these things as events right and you can compose them like events or you can turn the events into a behavior and then use it in uh, in one in one of these sort of like uh, interactive functions right at time and then uh, you, know, you then you would sample that thing once you finished composing it into whatever you wanted to compose it into, right? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, like I say, whether you use events directly or, or something like this, I think um, it depends on the application, right? I think for something like games, this could be really useful, or visualizations, um, <clears throat> but I wouldn't necessarily use it for everything. But I, I think it sort of provides, I, I'm curious to sort of see what people think, but I think, um, it, it gave me a sort of interesting way of thinking about FRP and like the connection to push pull FRP. Um, so I haven't sort of figured out all the details yet, but it seems like there's something interesting going on. You know, that's kind of the, when I, I thought about FRP or banging my head again for a while, it was also the, what I like concluded in is that who gets to decide when to sample this stuff? 
is like if you can delay that as far as possible, mm -hmm. then that's like a useful property. But that also means that these things are like they are not that useful when you have too many different places at which you want to sample. Because then like they are great for a game or something because you have the game loop basically, which is like this one I want to sample sixty times a second, preferably if you're that fast. Um, but if you've got things like, yeah, yeah, I've got this web socket where events are coming in, which I want to use to sample something. But then I also have user input, and which is also a discrete stream of events and stuff. So if you have too many things that you want to sample on, you kind of lose that, that composability because you can't stay in the, in the behavior world. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm going to try and build a game with it or something and see. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, I've, I've built little toy, toy applications with it. I, I want to try using it for an actual game and see how it how it goes. Um, the other thing I'm really curious to do, like I say, because it's um, because it works with any applicative, I really want to try and do like something where um, instead of having you know only functions of time, I want like functions of space as well. But, you know, the graphics. Um, like vector graphics, and then you see if I can use the exact same technique to uh, rasterize vector graphics. I think it would be kind of cool. So then you can just express your game as like one big, uh, you know, one big function, right? And then sample that. Thing. Anyway. Stuff. Yeah. Oh, that makes me curious. Could it? Could Could you build an animation library on top of this? Um, sure. I mean, the one I have right now is uh, uses uh, pure script drawing, right? Yeah, I was thinking if, if, like, because you can compose animations in a way as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean like end to end, like easing functions and things? So yeah, I was I was wondering if you That's, could. That was one thing I wanted to try and do with this. Yeah, I, I want to try and like build a library of easing functions, probably. but ones where you can like interact, you know. So Phil, did you take a look at uh, Reflex at all when you were writing this? Um, so I've looked at Reflex in the past. Uh, okay. I don't know the implementations of the in internals of Reflex. Um, I, I mean, I, I sort of know, uh, I know about like the dynamic thing um, and, and like events and behaviors and the dynamic as well, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't really know enough to compare. Are you, are you familiar with it? Um, I'm only, Trivially familiar with with reflex and how how reflex works. Okay. I've tried to use it. It seems kind of complicated, but supposedly it is used for building just normal web apps. Um, right. So using FRP to to build an app that you would otherwise build using something like Pux, um, but you right. can do it using FRP. I think that's that's interesting. I'm wondering if that could be an application for this library as well. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, the the thing the thing I never really saw in, in Reflex, and I'm sure like there's examples I just sort of haven't seen them, is uh, like really using like the continuous time aspects of it. And I know you can do it because Reflex itself, like the underlying library Reflex, is like a, a full sort of FRP implementation, right? But um, I always sort of see things in, with Reflex DOM where it's all sort of events and clicks on buttons and, and things. Um, so I'd really like to see how Reflex uh, handles that sort of stuff, um, and like what the ideal use cases for that sort of thing would be. Uh, I seem to remember like a drag and drop example at one point, which probably seems like a good fit for that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I should look at Reflex again. I haven't looked in a while. I did a little be, project with it at one point. Be um, prepared to set up uh, Nix. Yeah, <laughs> I, use, you can't install anything. I used Stack. Uh, somebody had like a nice Stack config at one point, and it just sort of worked, and then I tried rebuilding it. A while later, and like upgrade, and, and the upgrade broke. But <laughs> um, when it worked, it worked really great. So um, I'll have to try it again. So this kind type of UI work, I think like CycleJS does a lot of this. Um, you know, mm -hmm. where everything becomes almost like an event listener. I guess <laughs> it's the best way to describe it. But yeah, so you you you, you handle all your side effects, don't you, um, externally? And then everything that's in your program, you just compose. 
Uh, but, but is this stuff because I, I I missed the beginning. But did you say that like you could put in observables in events, or what sort of level does it set? Is it set sort of a similar? Because I guess that like cycle and stuff, JS is all built out of um, observables. So I just wonder. Yeah, so, well, I don't know all that much about cycles. I mean, my I, my understanding is that you have you know observables and subjects and all these things, and then you can form cycles, right? Where you know you have clicks on buttons, you know, it cycles back into my observable graph, and uh, yeah. and it works its way through, and I get a new DOM element, and then I get more clicks, etc. Right? Um, so I haven't done anything with the DOM first of all with this directly. It's been like Canvas and things, but um, it seems like there's sort of an interesting. Uh, connection with like that fixed B combinator, right? Like where you have you're expressing your whole system as like a fixed point, and um, I, I kind of like the way Behaviors does it because um, it's sort of uh, in terms of like you know what you're trying to denote, right? I'm trying to denote a, a pure like I'm trying to denote a function, an interactive function of time, right? Um, the fact that it involves sort of connecting two events together and like forming this network of events behind the scenes is sort of immaterial, right? In, in Cycle, you'd have to sort of wire it up and, and it has to be very explicit, as I understand it. But here, you yeah. just it's a fixed point, right? Like, it's done a, denotation is like uh, a function. It's what I, you know, it, it's, it's very like, clear, I think, right? There's no sort of explicit wiring going on. No, that was, that was the main problem. I mean, even like um, Rightfold mentioned, because it's extreme, um, which is now what they use instead of uh, I forgot the other one, RxJS um, under the hood. But yeah, it, it it gets really problematic because you really have to do all your wiring from the point of source. So I, you know, your user input, and then you have to wire all your data throughout your app. And then if at one point you've got like say the wrong fold, or you know you're doing a map when you're not meant to your whole app just doesn't work. <laughs> it's just like, it's, I just found it super painful. Like I did a lot of it and it was really cool to be able to handle, you know, um, events like that. That was really interesting because it is flipping that push and pull um, mm. paradigm around, which is really cool. But yeah, it, it, it did. It, I felt it, it hit. And then you'd get a lot of times where um, it'd be really difficult to sort of uh, things like, um, you know, XHR and things like that. It, it'd start, you'd, you'd get like an almost an internal cycle and you'd have to try and, so you'd have to have, you'd rely like on an A of a B and then you'd have to get the A coming before the B. And it just, yeah, so it just like, to keep it pure was really difficult at certain extents. But I mean, you yeah, know, I'd have to watch the beginning of this and see. The other place where I think behaviors can fit in really nicely actually is in uh, like testing these things, right? So you said it's so difficult to make sure it's correct. So yeah. the, the cool thing is when I showed the implementation, right? Like nothing really depended like directly on the implementation of events, right? It depended on like a bunch of um, like signatures, like, uh, you know, I need to be able to sample them and I need to be able to uh, build a step function or, or whatever, right? But, or, you know, it needs to have an applicative instance or I need to be able to, you know, create one from like a sync or something, like sync in a source or something. Um, but it didn't really depend on the particular implementation of that. So like another interesting thing is that we can say, um, I can pick like a, a completely pure implementation of events, right? Like it could just be a list, like a zip list. Um, and I can, uh, I can test these things by like recording or otherwise getting like a, a simulated list of events and times. And then just like running them through the the behavior network, like the, the event network, right? Um, because I can I can build events out of like uh, I can build behaviors out of like uh, these pure events instead. Um, so I think that's that's going to be kind of interesting to to try out. But I haven't tried it yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's essentially you, you you have your program pre ready for events to happen. Um, I think. Yeah. So your test would be just you know here's my the code would be exactly the same, right? Like it just, instead of being hooked up to the actual like mouse clicks and timer and all that sort of stuff, it'd just be driven by a list of like predetermined events. Oh yeah. yeah. Run them through the network. And at the end you say the value of the function should be this thing at time T uh, and you can test that thing. Oh, totally. Yeah. You could, you could totally just rip out, you know, the actual, because it's not connected, you know, at the end it's doing IO, but you could take that chunk out and just, 
put your own input in. Is that what you're saying? And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah like simulate any like XHR stuff. Or yeah, it's super. I mean, that was one of the well, things. It's, it's the same code, right? Like if we yeah. write generically enough, it's like exactly the same code. So That was one of the benefits of, for writing tests. Because it was all functional, you were, you know, you were able to segregate that stuff out. But if you start <laughs> using things like React and things like that, it's, it's kind of embedded. So it's a little bit harder to, to achieve that. Yeah, cool. It looks interesting. I have to look into it. Cheers. Cool. Thanks. All right. Should we do the uh, prelude thing, Alex? Um, let me share my screen. I think you can see. Um, yeah. So I, I was taking some notes about the prelude modules. Um, I wonder if I have that open. Prelude. Um, because the, the, the Prelude is relatively small subset of all the modules in the PeerScript ecosystem. Um, even like a lot of the modules that I use every day um, aren't in Prelude. Um, things like Monoid and maybe and either and uh, you know Tuple that's not in here. Uh, bifunctor, foldable, like a lot of this stuff isn't in the prelude, which I think is interesting. Um, uh, and that's like a separate discussion for what should be in the prelude, but I'm more interested in documenting or discussing like a lot of the modules that everybody uses every day. So like the natural place to start would be like the prelude, because <laughs> that's kind of like uh, the starting point for a lot of people. It's included by default in like when you pop in it to project and the prelude is right there. Um, right. So there's more than the prelude. Um, there are like, even before the prelude, there's a thing called prim. I don't know a lot about prim. Uh, I think it's like just always available, like in the peer script level. Um, and there, and so then there's like the function and that, that, uh, the function type, uh, types in, um, uh, the arrow as well as like some, uh, literals, like the arrays, the object and record literals, um, strings and then some type classes are built in and so like uh there's not a, like yeah so like like how to document this is kind of uh, how to discuss it how, where to document it and like how to introduce it is kind of a problem that i'd like to uh discuss and solve um right so then like at, like after we like discuss and explain the prim um then there's the prelude um and so if like I spent a little bit of time to try and like prioritize like in, in order of dependencies like which prelude modules depend on other prelude modules um, yeah and it, like that, that's not too difficult to do um, so like in coming months I'd like to start with these very basic very basic things in the prelude and discuss some of those like semi semi groupoid and category and like we can do like uh, maybe like one of these groups um, in one month's meetup. Um, and we could, uh, do a different group in the next month's meetup so that like the size, yeah, the size of them works well for each day. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this could keep us busy just like doing these basic things in the prelude. Um, and then after the prelude, um, there's a, a couple of different directions to go. There's like some really useful, uh, modules like, uh, data.newType, uh, data.function.uncurried, uh, const. And some other, like there's a few other ones you could put in there too, like maybe AF or uh, yeah, those. And then there's also like some type level things, um, and s s these are relatively important because a lot of libraries tend to use some of these concepts. So I think we could go in that direction after we introduce uh, a lot of the prelude things. Um, and then there's the like even even after that, then, then there's a lot more core things, uh, like like monoid is in here. It's not not part of the prelude yet, at least. And then there's a lot of functor, like advanced functor concepts, like composing functors, and uh, there's like this entire tree with extend and alternative and alt. Um, and then, then there's bifunctor and contravariant, and like a lot of these other like these are kind of universal concepts that everyone should know, but it kind of has little coverage and little. Um, uh, it's not well, it's not as widely known, I believe. So like, I think we should hit some of these things too, um, 
but we need somebody like in our community who's really familiar with um, and can explain some of these things. Um, and that's like another thing I'd like to have too, is not only explain like what these things are, but like where we like to use them, like why we like these concepts. Um, because like adding the human angle to some of these is would really make it stick in somebody's mind a lot better and uh, inspire some ideas for where to use them. Um, uh, yeah, so like there's just tons of modules here. <laughs> it's almost overwhelming. Um, but like we can uh, just do like a lot of the most common ones. Um, yeah, and then the, at the very end, there's a bunch of data structures, but uh, I think those are um, relatively self-explanatory. Um, yeah, so that's like what I uh, wanted to introduce to us here today. And then um, in coming months, maybe I'll find some system for uh, distributing these for like some volunteers who are familiar with the concepts or familiar with the areas. And like, so like next month we'll have somebody uh, uh, explain like a lot of the prim stuff um, and maybe maybe we'll start maybe we'll start doing some some of the basic stuff in Prelude also next month. But yeah, so like if this sounds like a good plan, but like, is there any like suggestions for or things that we should watch out for and not do for this um, trial? Um, so is this for like uh, talks? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, for can it be cool to also alongside? I know it might be asking a bit much for whoever's doing it, but to also maybe add to docs. So it'd be like you'd have videos and yeah. then have documentation as well because you'd be sort of almost doing two birds with one stone, I guess. Right. Well, that, 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 that's something that I was kind of the motivating fact, factor for this is like documentation. But yeah. it's like you can only document these things if you're already like pretty familiar with them. Uh, like that's one, that's one thing. And then the other way you can get, because we don't, we don't want docs. We want like good docs. And so good docs is like somebody who knows nothing about it can read the docs and then they have a pretty good idea of it. So like the people who write the docs should be people who don't know much about it. <laughs> and then they work with somebody who does know a lot about it. And then um, that we can make good docs that way. So, yeah. But I mean, if you look at like, um, is it MSDN and stuff They're they're essentially wikis, aren't they? So you put docs and if things are wrong, people change them. Right, but you need but you need to have that starting point. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And then you don't want to be putting rubbish up there, I guess. Right. So there, like, there, there's there's multiple ways of solving like the documentation problem, um, and like this, this is one way. This shouldn't be our only way of like documenting these things, but like having it verbally and explained in one way by somebody who's familiar with this stuff, that's like some good source material. And then after that, uh, you know, the same people or newbies to the concept can reference that high quality source material and then write docs for the libraries. That would be a lot helpful to other newcomers. Like that, that, so, that, that's kind of my idea of how this would work. So as we have listed here stuff that doesn't have any documentation or currently has some, cause I recall that some of this actually has some pretty good explanations. Like I had no idea what a ring was and I'm like, okay, I want to use addition. Where does that even come from in here? And I'm like, I just searched for it in Pursuit and found, oh, it's in Euclidean Ring or something like that. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but I'll just go in the documentation and, and okay, the explanation is actually pretty decent. For that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like alongside some of these type classes and data types, there is some inline, like in the code, inline documentation for the concept itself. And that that's like a lot of these modules do have that and that's pretty great. Um, but it still doesn't uh, solve the problem of like uh, introducing really useful concepts to beginners so that the same concept isn't reinvented. Because <laughs> um, that's something that like, like I, I, I might do every day in my, in my, code, in, in my coding. Um, like, like I don't know how to solve a problem. I don't have any thing in mind, like any concepts in the pure script world that I could use to solve the problem. And uh, yeah, so and I just write some kind of weird code to solve it, and it works that way. But um, yeah, so and I think you're asking about like inline documentation versus like a different place to put this documentation. I'm not sure about how to, how, how to answer that question. Um, but like what like if I read the uh, inline docs, that doesn't really instruct me to like if I make a new data type, like does it make sense to make an instance of this class? 
Okay. Like it doesn't give me a lot of intuition behind it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, it. And of course that depends on where a person's coming from when they're reading that. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it's different than a tutorial. It's more like it, just uh, a definition of what it is instead. Yeah. Um, that's what I, that's what I'd like to see a definition of what the concept is and um, when you might find it in, in wild, like where to look for it. I like that. Um, cool. And then like, if you hit some that don't have any dots or whatever, then, then that might be a, like a, you can flag it and kind of go, Oh, there's no docs about this one. But like you said, like, like, like working said is there's a lot of stuff that might already have documentation. I was just thinking of like, Oh, if we're going through all this and doing little videos and then giving example, like real life examples, which is a lot more useful than, you know, because <laughs> I read a lot of stuff and I get very confused <laughs> mm -hmm. often because I'm not seeing it in context. That's, that's, that's the hardest bit, you know, once it's like, like for example, you know, a do and a moan, a, a do monad or a maybe monad going through a do. I was like, you know, you read it and you're like, what the hell is that? And then when you use it, you're like, Oh, okay. It's not that bad. It makes a lot of sense. So I, I, I know what your inspiration is coming from. It's, it's kind of, some stuff might seem super confusing, but if you're shown and you have sort of real life examples, it will, it will make a potentially a lot more sense and be less uh, intimidating, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, but I fear in, in that case, the plan Alex outlined might not work. Like it's a bit the exact opposite by because when we're starting with the prelude, then, uh, and we get to functor, there's nothing to talk there to talk about that except for the laws because the data structures come last and so um fact is this very abstract thing then in that world but you don't have any data structures to give examples for which is like the like the, the crux the crux so you're like yeah that's this data structure now is it a fact or not but for that to you need to start with the data structure, basically, if you want to do it in a tutorial way. If you want to explain what a functor is on its own, that's a very abstract thing. Well, Which I might think that's still be helpful. Yeah, like having specific examples, uh, so like learning a data type or learning functor, and then to illustrate how functor, like what a functor is, then you pull in some of these data structures or maybe other some of the uh, prerequisite type classes. Like to help explain functor, I think that makes sense. But like having the um, a topic of just like list, um, that's not too great. I, I think like using it to uh, explain like a functor or some of the other concepts are is a better idea. But yeah, it's a concern. Yeah, functor usually is not that bad because people <laughs> are used to arrays and lists, or like they have seen the map function before. But if you throw hating algebra at it might be a bit confused but if you show them that's it's a way to neatly compile predicates like predicate functions that's kind of neat I, I guess a, uh, a higher level question is who exactly is this documentation targeting it seems like a lot of the people in this in the that are using pure script are coming over from Haskell so they're familiar with a lot of things like this but are there, is there a large portion of the community that's coming over from something like JavaScript and they're not familiar, they've, been, like, they've never seen any of this stuff before in their life? Yeah, I'd, I'd say there's going to be more and more people come from JavaScript for sure. I don't, that's where I came from. I know a lot of people at the moment, you know, the whole functional programming in JavaScript is like super buzzword. You know what they're like <laughs> JavaScript land. They, they just love following the buzzwords. But yeah, in general, they, you do see a lot of uh, even their programming, even like, you know, there a lot of libraries. It's, it's, it's seen as like a good pattern the more and more things are coming. Um, you know, I've not kept up for the, sort of the past six months in JavaScript world, but when I was doing it, it seemed more popular. So I think there's going to be... Uh, It'd be good to attract also newcomers that necessarily don't have any functional programming. Um, and that's not always a bad thing, because I guess, you know, there's, there is slight differences between PureScript and, and Haskell. Um, yeah. yeah. And they're not, they're not like, you know, super major, but it, it, I think this, this 
the because this is such a new language i i just think that like you could really get a lot of people interested in it if you do like elms managed it you know but it they're they're like not as powerful yes. as pure script <laughs> sorry Elm. Yeah, yeah but yeah. elm will not ever talk about it like will not ever have the ability to talk about hating algebra or <laughs> that's how they got around the problem we can only talk about map in the context of the data structure it's never yeah. coupled from it I think it's probably worth thinking about. Uh, so first of all, I, I do think this is worthwhile, by the way, uh, you know, going through this week by week. Um, but I think it's also worth thinking about um, how people actually use these libraries. Like, I don't think the majority of people, especially coming from JavaScript, but even Haskell is like start by like reading the Prelude documentation and working their way up through the abstractions. Right? I think it's more a case of they have something that they need to do and they do it naively. And then somebody comes along and says, oh, by the way, that's an applicative, and then they go find out what applicative is, mm. right? Um, so I think I think it's okay to sort of build it up this way because there's you know there's I think a lot of people do like learning you know in that way too. Like there's uh, you know the uh, what's that Professor Frisbee stuff and like where he builds up like the, <laughs> the right and there's all these things um, that work really well and people like it, so we should do it. Um, but we should make sure we're giving examples as we go along too, probably. Yeah, for sure. And we can have cartoon characters too. <laughs> or we can wear masks. I heard that jQuery is a monad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, like Phil said, like having examples is pretty important. And where I, where I envision this being in like a person's journey from like know nothing to, uh, you know, pretty proficient in a PureScript or Haskell um, language is uh, learn like the Haskell from first principles book or whatever, whatever the Chris Allen, Chris, Chris yeah. Allen, the Haskell book, like that's a prerequisite to whatever, to this series that we'd be working on. Um, because that book int uh, introduces like the syntax of, of this as well as like, uh, like curried functions as the basic unit and uh, immutable data and all this other, like these, these are kind of core concepts of, you know, our language. And then, so we'd, I think we can, we can leave that mostly, like presume somebody is familiar with, you know, most, like half of that book. Because like the second half of that book is, kind of gets into the territory that I want to cover, which is, uh, I think like functor, and I think they do applicative in the book a little bit. But there's a lot more than just those, you know, several concepts um, that are, that's in the, that's in like a working script user's vocabulary. There's a lot more concepts. And so I'd like to go like right at like at, like after that book, then they can like uh, start if, if they hear one of these concept buzzwords, they can look at one of our videos or maybe the accompanying written documentation after it's written and to learn more about why it's useful and when to use it. Um, so so here's, a, here's a random thought. Um, the Haskell book starts out with like Lambda calculus, right? Um, and I, I haven't got a copy and I've not read it. I've, you know, and I've seen the table of contents, right? So uh, I know like roughly the way it progresses. Um, maybe it would be useful to think about, like in a similar way to how that's the best way for people to learn Haskell, think about um, what's the best way for people to learn pure scripts if they want to do practical stuff, right? This is separate from the, yeah. the thing we're discussing here to a certain extent. Um, we should do that anyway. But um, maybe we should come up with like a curriculum and uh, you know, make one video for each section over the next. You know, if we're if we're planning on doing this so that people have like a library of videos that they can watch, um, and then we could have like a list of those things, uh, and then you know, when we have a few of them, it would make like a curriculum people could work through, right? So like start with like functions and stuff. I mean, one way to do it would be to take the PureScript book and work through it, but uh, I think honestly, the PureScript book could be like significantly revised at this point, made a lot better. Uh, but I just want to suggest that we do something like that at some point. Oh, also one more thing, just um, if we're going to start with Prim, by the way, I just want to say, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, if we're going to start with Prim, just be aware that all of the things that are type classes in Prim are probably like uh, a lot of, are going to take quite a long time to explain. So like something like union or road comms or something, or even like partial, uh, could probably be like a whole talk in itself. So uh, Prim is like, more complex than it seems, right? <laughs> Just don't know about that in mind. 
Yeah, that's yeah, a good point. Parts of it depend on like can only be explained in terms of the compiler implementation because it's so tightly coupled to the way that like to the type checker, like some of these at least. Yeah, I have, I have some concerns about that. Um, Phil, yeah, you mentioned having like a, a curriculum that's in the, in the same realm as the Haskell book, but for peer script people. Yeah, so I'm just thinking like, what, what's the ultimate goal we want to solve? Is it, is it that we want to just document everything thoroughly and that's a fine goal, I think, or is it that we want to get people coming from JavaScript or whatever to be like productive in peer script as quickly as possible? Um, Maybe we can do both of those things at the same time, right? Um, well, I, I think yeah. having people learn the language uh, pretty familiarly needs to involve exercises. So if we have like a curriculum, then I like I envision that being a set of exercises, mm -hmm. as well as like if you have trouble with this exercise, then go read this, go read these docs, or watch these videos. Oh, what do you think about okay. that? Yeah, maybe we can talk about that separately then. But mm -hmm. okay. I think I think the libraries thing is going to be a good thing anyway, so we should definitely do that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. As far as like the timeline for when we do this, like we can we can handle that later. But yeah. So I'll like try and get this up on I don't know some wiki or document somewhere so we can organize it a little bit further. Yeah, okay. you get an outline for a curriculum of some sort. That'd be cool. <laughs> or you could just copy and paste Haskell book one and pure script. <laughs> okay. Right, I have to get going, um, but okay. thanks very much. Yeah, Robert. thanks a lot, Phil. See you next time. All right. See you later. Talk soon a bit. Yeah. Bye. Or yeah. maybe you just volunteered to write a new book, Alex. <laughs> No, I crowdsourced the book. <laughs> I'll create the chapters and then Vince will make no all way. the content. <laughs> Does anybody know or have, have any data on new people coming into the language, like where they're coming from? It seems like just because of the, the sheer size of the JavaScript community and because PureScript is specifically designed to compile the JavaScript, that that would be the primary um, group of people that the language is targeting. But I wonder... Um, Hard to tell, I think, is there's mm -hmm. so many hidden pure script developers. It's Our like, biggest incubator would be Elm, probably. Elm. Elm. I, I actually, I did start with Elm, and <laughs> I tried to there use it tried so hard, but it was just too frustrating, and then I just gave up on Elm, and this pure script is very similar to Haskell. It's, um, I, I think it's much better. In the sense, pure script actually, is... I guess that, that is the community that people come from, because I came from there. Right. So, in a sense, PureScript is a bit of a language designed by people that think type functional programming is the way to go. Yeah. And they built the language that they enjoy using. And uh, that's kind of where we're at yet now. So, there's no, I'm not saying there's no way, but it's uh, less focused on taking over JavaScript programmers and more. Oh, so you already think that this is the way to go. Well, we built this pretty nice to use language that you can use to actually build stuff. Well, I mean, for it, way because, you in, know. because in JavaScript, there are, there's libraries like Ramda, and then there's things like Fantasyland that try to add, um, try to add all kinds of Haskell-like things to JavaScript. Uh, and then, of course, you have Flow, which doesn't really work all that great, but it tries to add types. So... It seems like Pete, there's there is a group of people in JavaScript that are trying to reconstruct one, a language like PureScript in JavaScript, and it'd be easier for them to just come use PureScript. Yeah, I keep trying to convince them. But. <laughs> well, half of like half of the fantasy land people usually hang out in the PureScript channel and try to steal our steal our library ideas and. <laughs> <laughs> It's like their own way of puzzling things. I love, I love it when you're acting, uh, a colleague of mine who who does lots of the like free, free libraries in JavaScript, like the free monad stuff. When he talks about type aligned sequences in JavaScript, like which is just an array of functions in JavaScript because it's dynamically typed, so there is no existential types. Like there's no types, but he's still talking about the type aligned sequences because he took all that from Haskell literature. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> but I mean, it definitely is one way to understand how these things work is by re-implementing them. And if you're very used to JavaScript, it's, it's easier to re-implement it in the language that you already know that you can like, put breakpoints into. Which you can actually <laughs> do in Haskell, which very few people know. But <laughs> but I'm not sure if um, if these people, people like these people, if they actually want to use PureScript, I think it's more that they they are, they are having a good time re-implementing all this stuff in JavaScript. <laughs> it just shows it reaffirms their belief that JavaScript is the master language. <laughs> you can do anything in it. Well, I mean, it's it's fun to operate under constraints. That's how I got to use Haskell in the first place. Can I can I solve these problems that I know how to do in Java? Can I do them in this weird esoteric language? Which is... you just say Java? Oh yeah, I knew it. I started with Java. Oh. Ugh. I think I think one of one of the hurdles though, even for people who are really interested in functional programming, um, and if they had some kind of good introduction to type systems and uh, the kind of stuff that you can do with PureScript or Haskell or similar languages, is that there's a barrier to entry that it's really intimidating. And there's all these terms like, of course, Monad and like all the Monad tutorials. It's just super intimidating to to most people. I mean, when I first came to Haskell. I never, th I, I had, I never thought that it would be practical. I thought, okay, I'll just learn this as like, just as an academic exercise because it's not, it's not a useful language, but I'll just learn it anyway. And now, actually, it's like it's my favorite language, and I use it for web, build web applications. So 